Here I am in the heart of Seoul in Korea, and I've docked in for Intel's Memory and Storage Day, where when I came into this, I was thinking, well, I'm an enthusiast PC tech channel that focuses on graphics cards, CPUs, all that good stuff. What would Intel want to do with the Yes? Then I thought about it and I thought, well, lately I've been bringing the energy and that's probably what they want, coupled with their storage and memory devices, which have a lot of good news to share. And initially I came into this, I gotta be honest, came into this thinking, mm, it's memory and storage, it's not going to be that exciting, but I came out of it being blown away by just how much is going on in this section of the industry and today, I'm gonna to share all that with you. But first off, big thanks for Intel for sponsoring out this trip. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to go through Japan to get you guys all the juicy content that you love. So Intel had a few products on display, but the one that caught my eye and started really opening up things in terms of where the future's going with tech was their DC persistent memory. And essentially the DC stands for data center. And this is where a lot of money and innovation is going in the tech space, especially when it comes to utilizing more and more volatile memory, which if you were to get a server with one terabyte of DDR4 memory, for example, it would cost a lot of money. But Intel have already released to the data center market their first generation of this memory, codenamed APAC Pass. And what we saw on display at the conference was their second generation codename Barlow Pass, which helps bring down the latency significantly and closer to that of DDR4 memory, which in this case, they've already got DIMMs that come in at 128 gigabyte, 256 and 512, where DDR4 memory isn't even close to getting 512 gigabyte DIMMs. So you may be thinking, why would the server industry want to implement DC memory to begin with? Well, the answer to that comes down to simply the cost effectiveness of DC memory, where a stick of this stuff costs only a fraction of DDR4 RAM. And looking on the net at roughly the prices, which Intel didn't give us at the conference, we can see that it's coming roughly at a fourth or a fifth of the cost of a DDR4 memory stick. And when you start scaling this to say, for instance, even a one terabyte server, that's when things start to really cut costs for the industry and the server industry. And so on top of that, there's another benefit too, where the power savings start to come into play. That is on a server model, not only could they save a lot of money in the actual initial costs and outlay of the hardware, but also on the power savings, where the DC memory is also very cost effective in terms of its power consumption. Using Intel's new 3D cross point memory, it's breaking the boundaries between fast server memory and having to access the slower memory, which can cause a lot of problems for massive streaming services, banking industry, and the list goes on. So getting a hands-on look at this really showed me where a lot of money and a lot of innovation is going in the tech space. And as an enthusiast, I did have some questions of my own about DC memory and how it can help us. And so we'll move over now to an interview I did with a chap named Riley, who was very good at telling us how this stuff is going to help businesses besides the cost factors. So now I'm here joined by Riley and he's gonna talk us through the big benefits of Intel Optane DC persistent memory and I guess where it's being implemented at the moment in the server industry and how over time it'll also transfer the end single user workstation environment as possibly even the single end gamer. So let's join over now. All right, perfect. So what we've got going here, we've got two servers. They're identical except for their memory configuration. The server we've got here on the left is the one that we care about because that's the one that has the persistent memory in it. Um, they're both running an in-memory database. It's, it's Aerospike, popular key value store database. And the takeaway that you need from that is that most of, most of the data is in, is in memory. It's built in indexes in memory. And what we're going to do is simulate a reboot operation, a power on, power off operation on these servers and see what happens to the database availability. So I kicked off the, the restart, and what we're gonna see very soon here is that the persistent memory system is gonna come back up very quickly. It's configured in app direct mode, and what that means is the data that was stored in the memory on restart is unaffected. It still will be there, and all the system has to do is verify that the database contents 
are still intact. And once it's done that, this, the database is back up again. That's what we're showing here. Um, so it's really, really fantastic. In the case of the DRAM system, we don't have that kind of responsiveness because it still has to rebuild all those tables in memory. DRAM by nature is volatile. The power off flushes the memory and it has to rebuild the database again. So basically over time this would have a benefit of say for instance uh, maybe a World of Warcraft server where they've got their maintenance and they've got to reboot the server. Exactly. They could do it a lot faster on Optane DC. Right. If they, if, they had, if they had some of their software that was running on their servers stored in Optane persistent memory you'd see similar kinds of results in AppDirect mode. So the next demo we got here is how uh, persistent memory can benefit uh, streaming services, mainly in the fact that since they now have uh, more cache available or cache, and uh, they will have more cache available because the uh, DC memory is uh, more cost effective, they can also benefit from that larger memory space when changing things over and not getting uh, stuttering, for example. So we'll let Riley explain this one a little bit more in depth. All right, so what we've got here, we've got two streams running side by side, two 4K streams. Um, the, the stream on the left you're seeing is being serviced by a traditional DRAM server. And the, the server on the right is benefiting from Optane persistent memory. Now, the reason that this, this little picture we've got going here is important is because, as you know, persistent memory, while it has great access times, is not quite as fast as DRAM. Um, but in this case, for content delivery networks, it, we have great quality of service, great user experience. What I'm, gonna go, what I'm gonna do now is request another stream of content. Now, these Optane persistent memory servers that, we're, uh, that are servicing our content have twice the capacity of the DRAM servers. And what that means is the cache space they have can store more content, and so we get that content back faster. In the case of the DRAM server, it has to refer back to an origin to locate the content because it just simply doesn't have enough cache space. Now this is great if you're talking about CDNs because the last thing you want when you're watching a football game on a Sunday afternoon is for latency to kick in. So now the next demo we're looking at here is density and uh, basically like a 512 gigabyte stick of DDR4 memory is pretty much way out there in the future but that's already possible on Intel Optane DC. So Riley's just gonna tell us how this will benefit uh, VM clients, for example, and get the most out of your hardware that you already have. All right, so what I've got running here is another in-memory database. This is uh, Redis using MemTier as a benchmark. And we've got 28 VMs loaded up. We're using one and a half terabytes of memory, which is already an absurd amount of memory, um, especially if you're more familiar with client-side parts. So what we're gonna do here is deploy 28 more VMs. We're scaling up to three terabytes of memory, which again, huge amount of memory, and if you were to use 128 gigs, um, 128 gig DIMMs of DRAM, this is about where you'd have to stop with this server. We've got two sockets, we have 12 DIMMs per socket. At 128 gig DIMMs, you'd be stuck at three terabytes. But Optane persistent memory, we have 512 gig DIMMs, so that means we can keep scaling. I'm gonna deploy some more VMs here, and we're gonna get all the way up to six terabytes of memory allocated on this server. We've got 112 VMs, currently running, and because we're using our top bin 8280L processors, which have 26, uh, 28 cores and then 56, uh, 56 uh, once they're hyper-threaded, each VM has virtual core dedicated to it, and we're using pretty much our entire CPU. In this case, that's great for us, because that means we're not wasting money. If you buy a CPU like this, and then can only get up to three terabytes of memory, you're not using half your CPU, and you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. Okay, so basically, like someone like Linus Tech Tips could have 112 users on one PC, kind of like a video like that. Coming it depends on your VM configuration. This specific VM configuration um, scales this way, but there's there's so such a wide range of how you could configure VMs. It's hard to say exactly how that would turn out. So now the plans for DC memory go beyond that of the data center and also the server industry. They've got plans to roll it out to the workstation market in 2020, and they're also collaborating with Microsoft to bring it to even the consumer end with some of the tangible benefits it can bring. For instance, me as a 4K video editor, one thing I would love to do would be to have enough raw memory past 64 gigabytes, for example, to just be able to load up all my editing files onto the RAM itself. That would bring some huge benefits when it comes to snapping a video together, say for instance versus the final render time, which only benchmarks seem to focus on. So after that, we went to a tour to the Naver Data Facility. They're the corporation that owns uh, the Line messaging app, for example. 
And you could just see even one of these racks in this one room where in this whole facility, there's like five blocks. So it goes much bigger on the scale of how much tech is at these places. One of these racks would probably be worth more than me and the whole audience and our tech combined, which is a huge factor in why stuff like this, although it doesn't get spoken about enough, is really important for the future. Now, what about us guys, the consumers that need data and we usually want it for cheap? Well, this is where the QLC-based SSDs come into play. Not only can they fit a lot of storage on one stick, for instance, a 3M side of an M.2 can now fit up to eight terabytes potentially on one drive, they can also fit a massive amount of storage on the cheap. This means that even at this current point in time on Newegg, they've got one terabyte SSDs going for around 95 bucks. If you can get them on sale, they'll probably be even cheaper. And so what they've done with these SSDs is a smart configuration. They've analyzed the amount of active data that people need out of their storage, and they've put a massive amount of SLC as the caching portion. And so on a one terabyte drive, for example, we now have a 140 gigabyte SLC cache size. And so what this does for the end user is it means that they're going to get a really fast experience, but if they do copy across a lot of files at one time, then of course they will incur slower speeds on the QLC based flash. However, in the hierarchy of NAND flash, we now have QLC bringing costs down. We then have TLC, which most budget drives are full of, and then we have MLC and then SLC. So combining the slowest and fastest NAND together can bring some big benefits to consumers in the form of 4K random read and writes. Now they have optimized these drives in conjunction with Silicon Motion and the algorithms they implement to get the most out of the 4K random read and writes, where we got 4K random reads going to 70 megabytes per second and 4K random writes going to 30 megabytes per second, which easily trumps that of pretty much any TLC based drive out there. And on top of that, they also throw in five year warranties on the drives, making them very competitive in the market space. But further innovations in the field don't stop there. This is only 64 layer. They're soon bringing out their 96 layer. And then after that, they have 144 layer NAND in development. And basically the potential of this allows them to fit a petabyte into something the size of a ruler. So we can see on the consumer side of things that hard drives will slowly be a thing of the past. Not only that, in terms of the future of the server industry, maybe over the next 10 years, you may even see hard drives begin to be phased out. Though of course those 16 terabyte drives coming out aren't going anywhere in the near future. So coming here to Korea for this event, I honestly came into this event thinking, oh, storage and memory, pretty boring, but I came out of it being blown away by where the industry is going itself. And of course, that trickles down to the consumer over time. But one thing they did have on display was their incredibly fast cold stream SSDs, which are going to be surpassed by their older stream SSDs. That's the code name for them. And essentially what these aim to do is bring CPU utilization up in the cases where they're fit for. As we saw with the DC memory replacement, that was bringing up CPU utilization where you could run a heap of different VMs, or of course you could get the benefits of having faster reboot times. Older stream aims to do the exact same thing in that where storage is a bottleneck, Intel hopes to alleviate that with their own tech. And with all that out of the way, I hope you guys enjoyed today's coverage of memory and storage. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button for us and also let us know in the comments section below what you think of the future of memory and storage. And also, before I get on out of here, big thanks to Intel for sending us through Japan to Korea and make sure you stay subbed with that bell ringing because we got some juicy content coming here in the land of KR. I think you already know what it's gonna be and I'll catch you in the next tech video very soon. Peace out for now, bye.